you want to? Excellent. There we go. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. This is Eli Sagor. Uh, I am an extension specialist based up at the Cloquet Forestry Center, and I'm glad to be here with you today. This is the October 2020 webinar uh, recorded or presented by the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative and the University of Minnesota Extension Forestry Team. We're really glad to have you all back, and we're glad to have Mike Dockery here. Uh, Mike is a faculty member in our Department of Forest Resources, and he's going to be talking about indigenous models of sustainability. Before we get started with Mike, I want to make a couple of short announcements. Uh, we have about an hour for this session. Mike is going to uh, pause a couple of times throughout his presentation, maybe to ask you to type some things into the chat or to, to uh, answer any questions. So I would invite you along the way, if you do have any questions for Mike, type those in anytime. You don't have to wait for him to pause. That way we'll have those questions queued up and can move through the content a bit more efficiently. You can also raise your hand. So if you click on participants, which I believe is at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a little raised hand icon. And if you have, if you'd like Mike to pause because he said something that you didn't understand or or for any other reason, feel free to raise your hand as well. We'll be watching for those and we can pause accordingly. I also want to briefly mention a couple of upcoming programs. Uh, Caitlin Wilson, my coworker at the Sustainable Forest Education Co-op, is organizing a three-part series called Woods Work. We've got three of those. Those are 90-minute sessions that are really active, hands-on, much more Q&A and active work than webinars. Those are not webinars. Caitlin and I have been getting a lot of use out of the not a webinar hashtag lately. We're really looking for models to engage learners, um, despite you know COVID and Zoom, to engage folks actively in learning. One of those addresses the seed lot selection tool. One addresses the climate change tree atlas and one addresses digital soil mapping. You can find more information about all of those on our website. We're also in the middle now of a three-week series on assisted migration in practice. It's really been a good program. We started up last Thursday. If you're interested in that, again, look for assisted migration in practice. It's not too late to register for that uh, program. And our second session is this Thursday. Uh, finally, our next webinar, uh, November 17th, will be on forest health updates from across Minnesota. We'll hear from a number of the DNR forest health specialists from around the state. Thanks, Caitlin, for posting those links. And with that, I'm going to hand the screen to Mike Dockery. Again, Mike is a faculty member in our Department of Forest Resources. When we're not at our home offices, our offices are right next door, and it's, uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure for me to get to know Mike and his work over the last uh, uh, couple of years. Uh, Mike, with that, you're on. Great. Thanks, Eli. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank, thank everyone for being here. Uh, just introduce myself real quick. Uh, I'm Mike Dockery. I'm a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. We are uh, have traditional territories around the southern part of Lake Michigan. I was born and raised in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And our tribe has uh, lands now in Oklahoma. So we were removed in the 1830s to Kansas and then um, in the 1860s down to Oklahoma where we became citizens and took allotments. I wanna I say I'm a forester. Uh, I've, I've worked, my undergrad is forestry, masters in forest management, and then a PhD in forestry as well. Uh, two degrees from University of Wisconsin and one from Penn State. So I'm, I'm very uh, attuned to people and foresters uh, working out in the field. And I wanted to give maybe an opportunity for people to think about sustainability in a little different way. And hopefully it can help you as you're making decisions for your clients uh, or yourselves. Uh, so with that, oh, I should say too, um, I worked for about 20 years with the US Forest Service before taking this faculty position last year. And my, my goal was uh, really to help educate uh, people around different ways of thinking about forestry, and in particular about how to start working with tribal communities 
um, in, in forest management and natural resource management. So something like this webinar, I was really happy to be asked to do because this is exactly why I wanted to kind of switch career paths, I guess, in my midlife crisis to become a professor. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm gonna share my screen and go through the presentation now. As Eli said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we can entertain. I've got a couple places where we'll stop and I'll ask you to think about some things. Uh, and then at the end, there'll be plenty of time to talk about this or anything else people have questions about. So the kind of three goals that I have for the talk today is one is to introduce this indigenous model of sustainability that was developed at the College of Menominee Nation in their Sustainable Development Institute. Then I wanna kind of use it to frame natural resource case studies um, as a way to basically think about multiple situations. And then three, another goal is to kind of explore our own values related to natural resources and tie that into sustainability. And if you're working for uh, a company or a client, we can say explore those values, you know, what do people want from their forest lands and how can those goals be integrated into this model? Uh, to do this, I'll talk about the Menominee forest management history. Uh, then I'll describe the model itself. And then I'll have an example of how this can really be used by foresters, researchers, communities, and planners. And then, like I said, we'll have time for questions and discussion. Before I get into the Menominee sort of history of forest management, I want people to take a moment, and this is where you can use your chat feature, um, to think about your own personal values related to natural resources. What are some values that you have? Maybe pick, try to pick one or two. Um, these values can be a place, could be a species, an activity, family history, might be a feature, might be water or rock, could be spiritual or religious re values that you have, could be money in the economy, could be something I haven't even thought about. Take a moment to kind of type that into the chat or, or write it down on a piece of paper. And like I said, this could be your own value. This could be a value that your clients have. I'm gonna circle back on this towards the end of the talk. And Mike, are you able to see the chat notes as they come in? I or think I like am if I click on it. Oh yeah, that's actually cool. I think I can have it up while I'm talking. Yeah, awesome. So just to make, clear i'm not blocking the slide right by having no. a chat oh. window open okay great that may so mike since you brought that up that may depend on the viewers individual screen settings so if you're watching not you mike but anyone out there watching if mike's video is blocking the screen the slide content and you'd rather it disappeared just look above uh, right above his video there are three little icons the one on the left uh which looks like a little dash will hide his video. So if you wish to do that, you can do it. It won't make it go away completely. You can always make it come back by clicking one of the other icons. Go ahead, Mike. All right. A couple of interesting comments there. Reciprocity, all of the above values, and some interesting things in the chat. Yeah, this is great. Food from the land. I think that the food one is really becoming important nowadays. Um, and it's something that I've heard tribal communities talk about. I've, I've held many, many meetings on both climate change as well as invasive species with tribes for the past 20 years. And one of the things that came up um, early on that I didn't hear in the non-tribal community was this idea of food sovereignty. Maybe if we were up in Alaska, we would have heard of non-tribal, you know, talking about that a little bit more, but now it's really important, I think, and we're recognizing the ability to be able to feed ourselves um, with traditional foods. That's great. Okay, so keep these values kind of in your mind because as I circle back after talking about this model, really a way of thinking about making decisions is around this, these values. So identifying a value in the beginning is important. So 
In order to think about this model that was developed at the College of Menominee Nation, I wanted to talk a little bit about Menominee Forest Management. And I apologize if you've heard this before. I'm hoping that everyone has, um, but if you haven't, um, I'm really happy to share this with you. As part of my uh, job with the US Forest Service, I worked with the College of Menominee Nation for about eight or nine years. So I was right on the Menominee Reservation and I got the opportunity to learn about their forest management uh, and their ideas about sustainability. So this is a map of Wisconsin created by the Menominee tribe showing their ancestral territories. It's about 14 million acres or so across Northeast Wisconsin. You can see Lake Superior to the north, Green Bay, you can see there. Um, and that color, you know, part of the map is their traditional territories. Now, Menominee people don't have an origin story, like, like my own Potawatomi or Ojibwe were relatives, Odawa. We came from the Eastern Seaboard through the St. Lawrence Seaway. We have a migration story. Um, Menominee have always been here. They're, they're, they, they arose um, from the mouth of the Menominee River. Um, they, they have been here forever. And in fact, when you look at some of the archeological evidence, you see the Menominee, you see Menominee, um, evidence for Menominee people pre-glacier, the glaciers came, the settlements sort of moved on that glacial margin. And then as the glaciers retreated, you see Menominee settlements coming back to where, uh, the, the, where they were originally, which is just astonishing. It's amazing. Um, and, and, and. Anyway, so they've always been here and they fought really hard to stay in their land. And in uh, 1848, I believe, either 1846 or 48, the, the Menominee signed a treaty that removed them essentially to Minnesota. They were coming here like a lot of tribes at the time um, as the government was expanding and, and getting land, uh, uh, getting tribes west of the Mississippi. Well, they were very politically astute and were able to renegotiate that treaty in order to stay in their lands in Wisconsin. Um, and, they've, and they've been fighting ever since to maintain their forests and, and uh, adapt to the new life on a reservation in, in Wisconsin. And really this deep value of their homeland and tie to place is, is what has sustained their community um, over these hundreds and thousands of years. This is a map of Wisconsin uh, showing the Menominee Reservation. It's about 235,000 acres and it's mostly forested and dedicated to sustained yield forestry. So it's not a preserve, it's actual um, set up for forest management. And this is, this is the iconic image. So this is just Google Earth. Uh, you can see Lake Superior to the north. And again, I believe you can see Green Bay as well. Um, but right in the middle here, if you can see my cursor, you can see that outline of the Menominee Reservation, right? That's a legacy. That's a sustainable legacy of, of harvesting timber. In fact, when you ask Menominee people, like, what is sustainability? Oftentimes they'll say, check it out. Look at the satellite image. That's sustainability. Our forest uh, symbolizes sustainability. It's sustainability in practice. It's sustainability in theory. From 1854, when that reservation was set up until today, they've been harvesting timber, you know, cutting trees and milling lumber uh, in a way that today they have more volume than when they started and the, and the trees are of higher quality um, than when they started. And they've taken out equivalent of over two and a half times the volume of when they started. So essentially you can think they have more volume today, yet they've taken out two and a half times the volume than when they started. Uh, that's sustainability. So the question was for the, the College of Menominee Nation, like how do we understand this forest, sustainable forest legacy? Um, and in the 1990s, the, the College of Menominee Nation started and they started thinking about, well, how do we, how do we really tap into this long history? You know, of forest management to understand sustainability, not only for the forest, but for the broader community, right? Um, and so they wanted to come up with, to, to figure out some key reasons for this, this sustainability. They brought together academics, they brought together forest managers, they brought together community members. And the goal was to provide some sort of framework for understanding the sustainability. 
and a framework that would also include the integration of Menominee knowledge or indigenous knowledge. And this is what they came up with. So this is what I'm gonna talk about. The Menominee uh, Sustainable Development Institute's Sustainable Development Model. So now I'm gonna switch gears here. I'm gonna take a quick drink of water and start talking about the actual model itself. Now, this model says that sustainable development, sustainability depends upon six interactive and dynamic dimensions. These dimensions include land and sovereignty. Now land and sovereignty has a very specific meaning for American Indian communities. Um, but if we think about it outside of tribal communities, I really like to think about this as do you have control over the land where you are? Who's making the decisions? Is it your community? Is it your company? Is it the US Forest Service? Who's making those decisions? And this model is essentially saying that this decision-making, this sovereignty over natural resources and land is a critical component of sustainability. And I think you can argue that if you don't have control over what happens on your land, that's not as sustainable as if you did. Okay. Another component is the natural environment. So oftentimes we think about sustainability from the three-legged stool model. You've got the ecology, economy, and sort of sociology or the social community aspects. So that's the three-legged stool. We see that in the National Environmental Policy Act. We see it in things like the triple bottom line. This model, um, also has something called natural environment, but it differs in the fact that natural environment includes human beings as part of that. And what you'll see in this model, all these six interactive dimensions, humans are part of every piece of it. And that's because in many indigenous uh, worldviews and in this one as well, humans aren't separate from the environment. You know, we, we're part of it. And, and so it might look very similar to the three-legged stool definition of sustainability, but um, it actually is a little bit different. So the natural environment is including human beings. Another model is in, or a piece of this uh, sustainability is institutions. So institutions can be very modern institutions like the University of Minnesota Extension as an institution, College of Menominee Nation, tribal government. Also, it can be traditional institutions like our clan structures, for example, which is a, a, a traditional way of uh, thinking about and organizing ourselves, right, in clans. So this is something in the model that bridges both sort of very modern institutions, as we've set up, as well as our traditional longstanding institutions. It brings those things together. And remember, one of the reasons for this model was to bring in indigenous knowledge, and I would say bring in multiple perspectives on sustainability. And using something like institutions can help us with that. Another piece of the sustainability puzzle is technology. This one as well. So remember, this model was how did the Menominee maintain their forest sustainably over time Technology is a reason, right? Now we use uh, modern GIS inventories, for example, modern harvesting equipment to make sure that we're not damaging soils, for example. Um, that's technology helping with sustainability. There's also traditional technologies for thinking about um, sustainability. These could be, you know, how do we harvest wild rice? Uh, how do we remove birch bark from trees and maintain the tree. Those are technologies that are very important with sustainability. So just like institutions, this, this dimension can incorporate both very modern things as well as traditional uh, technologies. Economy, that is a piece that we see in the three-legged stool explicitly. This one's great, I like this because it can give us different scales to understand um, the situation. We can have the economy of households. We can have community economy that can go up to state and regional and national and international economies. 
right? And we know that forestry plays in all of these levels, right? The individual logger, all the way up to the export market of, for uh, timber products. And so that I like that because it helps us start scaling sustainability and thinking about the different scales. And then the final one in this, this uh, model of sustainability is human perception, activity, and behavior. This is something that also scales from my perspective. It's something that we can say, well, why, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I see something and think this as an individual? Why do I recycle? Why do I approach forest management in a certain way? But it can also be more of that community as well. How do we collectively see things? Why is one community recycling and not another? Why does one community support, let's just say, bringing fire back on the landscape and another one not so much. That's a, a critical component of sustainability. And so these are the pieces moving further to sort of define what sustainability is. This model says sustainable development is a process of recognizing and balancing tensions, tensions that are inherent within each dimension and tensions amongst them, right? There's tensions, economy, tension on how much, when to harvest, how is that gonna play out? How is it gonna affect the natural resources? And this model, because it's very visual, as you see, um, the, the intersections are, these tensions are illustrated by intersections in, in the hexagons. And the model says, we have to recognize the tensions, but as the tensions are relieved, new tensions arise. Old tensions come back. Sustainable development is a process. It never ends. You don't say now we're sustainable, we can go do something else. Um, I like to think about this, one of, one of our academics uh, who works on traditional ecological knowledge and tribal understandings of things like climate change, he says that Traditional knowledge is a process. It's a continual and iterative process. This is Kyle White, if you're interested in looking his work up. But sustainable development, according to this model, is a process as well. And it fits in with that traditional way of thinking, right? Circle, things come back. Right? We can deal with one thing one day, but you know, in 10 years, that might be the same thing. And so recognizing sustainability as a process, recognizing this model is a way to sort of frame out a narrative. Where are the tensions? It helps us identify those tensions and then develop solutions to those tensions. So this question still arises, well, how have the Menominee balanced these tensions? If these six things comprise sustainability, if sustainability is a process of, re of recognizing and relieving these tensions, how have the Menominee done it? Well, that's where the values come into play. And in this model, we, this is the big, if you can get this word on Scrabble, you're gonna do, do pretty well on it. Menominee autochthony, autochthony. It's not a word we use very much in English. It's not a, we don't use it very much in the United States. It's used in, I speak Spanish as well. They use, they use that word in Spanish. Um, I, I've heard it, people actually use that in sentences. Here we don't, what does it mean? It means that Menominee people are from the land that tie to place that I mentioned in the beginning, that idea that Menominee people aren't separate from their land, that they come from this area that they've been in for hundreds and thousands of years. That tie, that value is how they recognize and balance those tensions. So they're keying in on how is that impacting our tie to the land? And that works really well with Menominee, but I think if you were looking at this model as something that can be broader, that our tie to place is important for making decisions. So if we wanted to take the model just the way it is right now, thinking about how do I fit into this land, um, that's important. But we can also tie back to the values that you wrote down earlier 
and start thinking about, well, if, if I valued water, if that was the, the, the main value that my community was in, interested in, how would I use that to sort of balance these tensions that are inherent in the system? So now I want to take, just take a minute here, think about that value that you wrote down or uh, either in the chat or on your, on your piece of paper and think about how you might use that to balance some tensions in this model. And I'm going to give some examples, so we'll come back to this, but I just want to give maybe like a minute. I want to check my time here, give like a minute to, to think through that. How would you use your, val your value to balance tensions in the model? So I'll, I'll help move this along a little bit. This model is really useful because we can use it to basically create a narrative, tell a story. Um, and it can, it can incorporate environmental change. It can incorporate indigenous knowledge, different perspectives. It can help us frame case studies or frame management um, objectives. Right? How do we get to where we're going? We can use it to tell a story about how things have changed over time. We can ask, oh, I'll get to a, a series of questions we can ask for each dimension. So we can think about the past. You know, what, what were the institutions that gave us the forest that we see today wherever we're working? How did that play into it? We can understand the present. Where are we right now? What are the current tensions in this system? How might I see tensions versus somebody else? What about my value versus somebody else's value? We can get multiple perspectives on this story. We can tell two stories together and weave them. The reason I'm really tied into this idea of a narrative is because I think it's a lot more easy for people to understand narratives than let's just say graphs. I could show you 30 graphs about climate change and how that may or may not impact forests in Minnesota. I can tell a story using each one of these pieces and pull out some tensions. And you can see those graphs come together in a way that's a lot more meaningful, I think, than just the graphs alone. The graphs are important, but how do we make sense of that to make decisions? And that's where I think this model is really, really useful. And we can use it to create this vision for the future. If this is how it was in the past, if this is where we are today, where do we wanna be in the future? And then what do we need to do within each one of these? How do we need to change our institutions? What has to happen with natural environment, including our own relationship with it? What do we need to do for decision-making? Land and sovereignty. How does the economy play into this, et cetera? And I think, again, like I was saying with the graphs, this, is, this narrative really brings together complexity and uncertainty in a way that can help us make decisions. I see 30 graphs in front of me. I don't know what to do with it exactly. But I start telling a story and I, okay, now the spring is gonna be earlier. What might that mean for my forest management? What's gonna to happen to winter logging? Where are those tensions? And how can we resolve those tensions? Mike, a couple of things were typed into the chat yeah. uh, in response to your question, thinking about the value uh, that you put in earlier. And yeah, great. It, so uh, understanding that things are changing. Uh, some of these comments are coming just to panelists, and that's, that's why I'm reading them. I'm, I don't think others can see them. And someone who earlier typed uh, planting different tree species uh, as their value indicated that different tree varieties could help combat forest disease uh, to not have a total area affected. So. You can see some of those um, uh, categories of the model reflected a little bit, uh, a little bit there. Yeah, and and I'll just riff here. You know, I heard you announce the assisted migration. I was going to make a joke about it snowing, and I want to be assistedly migrated south right now. But um, I guess I just made it. Um, but no, if we think about that, let's in context of different tree varieties for disease and climate change. Um, 
Well, how is that going to impact our, let's say, cultural institutions? Is that going to change the way, you know, I might go hunt? Maybe. Is it going to change some other things that, that we do culturally within our institutions? How is that going to change the DNR if we start really focusing in on that? So these are all questions that can come out of um, just using this model to kind of sketch. I use it as a touchstone. When I'm thinking about a problem, I kind of, I like to focus on the natural environment because I do ecology and forestry. And it's a, it's a, it's something for me to say, oh, hey, Mike, you really got to think about the economy. I'm not an economist. I need to think about that. I need to think about how people are thinking about things, seeing them, human perception, activity, and what are they doing out there? And how does that fit into the system? So it's a way, it's like a touchstone as well to kind of make sure that you're covering all these bases. And it's really useful because when we're thinking about sustainability and that three-legged stool, it's really hard for me to say, okay, Mike, think about economy, sociology, ecology. Okay, that's what is sociology? What is that social component of the system? That's too broad. Whereas this one in every single one of those dimensions has humans, it has us reflected into it breaks it down in a way that I think for me anyway is more digestible. So here's some questions that you can use to kind of construct a narrative, land and sovereignty. You know, I mentioned this before, does the community have control over their resources? What about in the past? Um, who's making the decisions? And then this is the key about that tensions among the elements. How does this affect the other model dimensions, right? Natural environment, you know, how has the natural environment changed over time? How has our relationship with the natural environment changed? How is it today? And how do these things impact things like our institutions, our perceptions, activities, and behaviors? Same thing with institutions. We can ask how are institutions organized? How have they been organized? How have they changed over time? And how does this impact the other dimensions? Technology, same thing. How is this technology influencing our natural resources, our perceptions? How's that changed over time? You know, how is technology used within the community? Um, how has technology changed over time? You know, our logging looks a lot different than it did 10, 15, 20 years ago. And certainly when we start going back to the, the horse logging days of the, of the cutover, right? That technology is really different. How has that changed? Economy, same thing. How does a local economy work? How does that fit in with the global and regional economies? How does economy impact other elements? The classic, right, is the natural environment getting negatively impacted by the economy, that tension there. That's a real tension. Human perception, activity, and behavior. How do individuals perceive forest management? This is a crux. Yeah, I see a comment about being a public forester and that this narrative it could be really helpful. Um, right, I, I, as a forest service, I did planning for my first sort of five years with the US Forest Service, writing management plans. A lot of different perceptions on what we should be doing out there. My favorite was one gentleman one time, I worked in Vermont in the Green Mountain National Forest and uh, he stood up and he slams his fist on the table and says, I want to get back to traditional uses of the land. And I had to take a deep breath and think, okay, what is his perspective? Because as a native person, I'm thinking, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I'm not sure exactly what he's saying. I said, could you explain? And he says, I'm talking about clear cutting, right? That's a perception that we weren't doing as much forest management uh, as, as this gentleman wanted. And why did he want that? Because his sort of cultural heritage of hunting uh, in early successional forests was not, you know, he didn't have that early successional forest available in the landscape like he did before, right? And we see that, that reflected in things like songbirds, right? The habitat for songbirds out there out east is, is that's one of the most critically uh, um, needed habitats because we don't have those open areas like we used to. Anyway, um, so this is kind of building the narrative. Now, this is where our value comes in too. So you build a narrative around these six elements, but still, then again, if we look at the Menominee and say, well, Menominee use their sense of place, their tie to the land as a way to balance anything. Um, 
we can use that. I think sense of place is something that we've been talking about a lot, but we can also use other values. My, my friend who I, I really started working with this model at the College of Menominee Nation, he was from Rocky Boy uh, Reservation. And he said, I always remember this. He said, if you brought this to my community, we would say water. Water was the key thing. Any, every decision we make has to do with water and how that's gonna impact water. What is the value for either ourselves if we're making decisions as, as homeowners or landowners, or for our institution, if we work for public forestry, or if we work for a company, you know, what's that value? How are we going to balance these things? I'm going to, I'm going to go to the next one here. I don't know if there's any questions. We got 1236 here. Let's stop real briefly for some questions, or I can go through an example of me building this narrative. Uh, Mike, I'm not seeing any questions now. Some really interesting comments. I don't know if folks are looking about looking at the chat, but uh, everything you're saying about narrative and sociology is very meaningful to me as a public forester. Now I know I've been looking in the right direction by devoting time to interacting with community members and hearing their stories and needs for public lands. Mm -hmm. Mike, you you already I think acknowledged that comment. Yeah. Um, I'll just say uh, uh, I guess I see one one new message here. But Mike, any anything further you'd like to say about that? I, I was struggling to try to figure out how do we bring in people's, you know, uh, well, how to bring in the people to the equation. I've struggled with that my whole career. I, I studied forestry in the early 90s, got my master's in the mid, like mid, early to mid 90s. And I, I, I studied ecology for my master's, forest dynamics. And I was like, where are the people? At that time, we weren't really talking about people in these ecosystems. Maybe out west a little bit with fire, but not so much here. And when I learned about this model, it was like it was a light bulb went off. Like we're not thinking about people because sociology is too broad of a category. What the heck does that mean? There's 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 just nothing there. And and also when I present this model and talk to, to students and groups about it, I get a lot of comments. Like we're seeing amazing comments in the chat here. Like if I was describing NEPA process, I guarantee we wouldn't have as many comments. And, and I'm, I'm imagining that your ideas are rolling right now as, as my ideas always do when I talk and think about this. Um, but if I was talking about National Environmental Policy Act, some of you might be sleeping now. And I've experienced that because I've given those presentations as well as a forest planner for the federal government. This is the rules we follow. And it's kind of like crickets, right? This is exciting stuff because I think it gives us a place of engagement to come together and tell stories. Because in reality, we all, we're, we're beings of stories. We talk to each other, we communicate. That's how we are as humans. That, that's one of the things that separates us, right? From other beings is we have this ability to tell stories and use language. And I think this model helps tap into that. Uh, Mike, one of the things when you and I talked on the Camp 8 podcast, I, I told you I, one of the things I really like about this model is is that it recognizes tensions. It, it doesn't run from those or, or try to, you know, quantify them out of existence. It, it recognizes those. And we have a comment here that I think gets to that one of those tensions, maybe between economic and other values. This person says, I see the right of way clearing an electrical company uh, line clearing using radical machines and not boots on the ground. This machine management preferred method seems very disruptive and destructive to trees in the land. Uh, do you have any thoughts? What do you think about these destructive methods? And, and we do have one more question after this before you move on. You can, why don't you read the other one and I'll answer them both. Okay, there. great. Uh, the other one is how can I, a little bit more uh, uh, ecological, how can I encourage a small patch of blueberries on the edge of a trail within a patch of 40 year old Aspen, how can I encourage them to expand without using fire, which is so hard to do these days? Yeah, those are, those are both great questions. I see them in a very similar light, right? You have technologies, one clearing land, one technology is using, you know, clippers, hand clippers. Certainly, I, so on the Finger Lakes National Forest where I also worked, we had a large blueberry patch that was slowly getting encroached upon by red maple and some other things. 
And we use Boy Scout troops and clippers <laughs> because of this fire issue. It was literally within a campground, a, a developed campground. So using fire there, which had been used historically, uh, was no longer able to be used. So we, we use clippers. So that's a different technology to get to the same spot of we want blueberries. We value blueberries in this space. The same thing with the right of way. So this technology is perceived as damaging or maybe ugly. Uh, maybe it takes away jobs. So it's in, maybe negatively impacting the economy. Um, you don't need a crew of 10, 15 people to go do it. You just need one person driving a machine. So Using this model, we can start talking about the trade-offs. And you'll see in my example I'm gonna do right now on clear cutting um, is a similar thing, right? We could change the technology. We could also change people's perceptions. Fire is not bad. Let's talk about the ecological system, this natural environment, and let's put fire in this historical context, in this blueberry patch. So let me go through the, 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 the sort of example on how to use this thing. And I think, um, I think this applies to both of these situations. So in this case, we have the natural environment. And we know that, um, that in the past, we have a kind of a mosaic across the landscape, of forest diversity. We've got diversity of species. We've got diversity of ages as we have windstorms and fire creating this mosaic across the landscape fire and wind are creating that. Humans are certainly uh, involved with using fire across our landscape here in Minnesota. Two species that are you know, dependent upon this kind of system, white pine and aspen. These are the bigger you know, blowdowns, the bigger fires, right? Where we need to really create mineral soil. We need to get light down to the ground. That's, that's how that ecology works on those species. Again, humans are involved because we have been using fire for hundreds of years. Um, but now, you know, we're not using fire widely across the landscape, even though there's definitely a desire by some to bring it back. Um, but we use regeneration harvests, right, for aspen. Or some people would say clear cutting. Even if we do shelter woods for the white pine, we, many people, lay people, would think of shelter woods as clear cutting as well. So that's kind of the natural system. This is how white pine and aspen come, come to be regenerated on the landscape. Well, we know that there's different human perceptions on this thing. Some people think it's great, right? That hunter in Vermont thought this is a wonderful thing because now they can hunt because they have that early successional habitat create that used to be more ubiquitous across the landscape and now it's not. Um, there's also positive perceptions about the species themselves, right? White pine, iconic species here, beautiful. Right, aspen. Right now, well, we're probably leaves are blown down at this point. But right, the the aspen in um, in the early spring and, and in the fall, just unbelievable. Those are beautiful landscapes that we have. Um, those are positive perceptions. But there are also some negative perceptions about clear cutting. Right, they look ugly. The slash piles that are building up on the you know on the landing uh, in the woods while the work is happening. That's some real negative stuff. That coupled with with perceptions that people have around clear cutting from kind of the out west idea of clear cutting. Um, yeah, there's lots of negative perceptions on that. So there's the tension between the natural environment, what those species need, and, and what some people think about it. So how do we deal with that? How do we change our, you know, relieve these tensions? You know, we can change our perceptions. Well, how do we do that? Um, I need to click again. We can change the perceptions by bringing in our institutions. I think a lot of us can look at this and say, well, if we had high school or maybe even grade school, understanding ecology, understanding that white pine needs mineral soil and how do you get that? Otherwise you don't get white pine in there. It grows old and dies and it's replaced by something else. Um, we can change our institutions in that manner, education. We could also start thinking about new technologies. And that's where like, okay, so if burning isn't working for blueberries or if you know those, those brush hogs aren't working for the clearing the right of ways, well, is there another technology that we can use to get the same result? 
And this is my magic wand thing on my white pine example. Like maybe there's something we can do that's not clear cut. Maybe we start like really looking at how small of a gap can we have before we can really regenerate groves of white pine. Maybe there's something different we can do. That's in, in essence kind of how I approach this model and thinking through these systems. And now I'm going to bring us back and this kind of gets, this will be the discussion here. We'll close out. I think we've got about 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes. Um, you know, think about the value you wrote, think about who you work for, you know, how can you use that? And so for the Menominee, you'll, you'll never hear what you might hear from some of the environmental groups out West. And, 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 and what you hear is don't harvest trees on our public lands. Menominee, you're never going to hear that because their value to place incorporates harvesting trees for timber. You're going to hear discussions about how much to do, how to, uh, you know, where you're doing, you know, where do we regenerate white pine? How much acreage do we regenerate every year? Those are the kind of discussions you're going to have. You're not going to have people saying, don't cut a tree ever, because they recognize that, that in order for that white pine or the aspen, you need some management at this point. You know, start thinking about what kind of dimensions can help you relieve those tensions. And maybe we need, need to, to reinvigorate our educational systems. Like maybe we need to be working more with the high schools and with the state uh, curriculum for the grade school, right? Should we be teaching some of this stuff? I think, yeah. We also might need to be working at the university level. So um, I'm, this is my penultimate slide here just to, to bring us back to a discussion. This model is based on a Menominee experience and trying to explain how they've been able to manage the forest over time. It's practical in the sense of that Google Earth image, you can see it, it's working. Um, it's really flexible. You can think about the past, present, and then you can use it to develop solutions. Um, it can be used by foresters, right? We can use this to think through. If we've got a client that wants wildlife, let's talk to them about some of these different avenues. Let's talk about what is your main value and how does that help us manage sustainability? And how might something that is perceived as ugly, let's just say clear cutting, how does that act, how do we change that perception in a way that actually can help that natural environment and help those species ecologically? Um, this model is dynamic, so it can be, we can talk about the United States or the, the rainforest in Brazil, or we can talk about our back 40, right? We can look at, um, look at time and space in a dynamic way with this model. And finally, it can incorporate different perspectives. I work with tribes, really it can incorporate indigenous knowledge and values, but it can also incorporate any other perspectives that we might have. So I say Miigwech, those are my kids from a few years ago. Um, I think they've got all their teeth now. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna stop my share here at this point. And so maybe we can have a discussion, any questions or comments. That sounds great. Mike, thank you for that presentation. Um, I will uh, invite folks, if you have a question for Mike that you would like to uh, share via chat, please go ahead and do that. Again, you can share it either with everybody or just with panelists. Either way will work. Uh, you're also uh, welcome, if you prefer, to raise your hand using the, you could click on participants, and then you should see a little hand raise icon uh, I think at the lower right, it appears differently to me when I'm a, a host, uh, but I believe you'll find that at the lower right of the panelist window. And if you raise your hand, uh, we can allow you to use your mic and you can ask your question verbally. Uh, whichever of those works for you is just fine. Uh, Mike, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. Let's see if, uh, if any roll in. The snow is really coming down here in the Twin Cities, let me tell you. I was Someone mentioned that they could see it in, uh, I guess, behind me through the window. Yeah, it's funny. It's, the ground is getting white now. Yeah, the, uh, I, I'm starting to enter into hibernation mode. I'm, I'm feeling yeah. a desire to go take a nap. You're wearing <laughs> such a warm looking sweater. Um, any large non-native forest managers using Menominee concepts, using putting this model into practice? I think so. I, I mentioned I used to work for the Forest Service. Right. The, the reason they sent me to the College of Menominee Nation was exactly that point. What can we learn from Menominee? Can we build a partnership where 
you know, when we look at the Nicolet National Forest just to the north there, and that's part of that boundary, um, what can we learn and how can we bring sort of those concepts into the federal system? I've presented this actually maybe, oh, it must have been 15 years ago now. I presented in Washington as the Forest Service was developing their new planning regulations for forest management planning. And I, I gave a presentation with all these other scientists. I pulled this model up and talked about it like I'm doing today. Um, and the idea was let's, let's get that into how we think about sustainability. Um, it didn't get written into the planning regulations, but I think the concepts have really permeated and percolated in people's minds as they hear about it. Um, so I think, I think Menominee is, is really um, something that many, many landowners, particularly the Forest Service, are looking for. I, I've, I've given for private landowners too. I, I used to run the tours on the reservation to see forestry. And in order to give the, the limited time that the foresters have to do their actual work, they said, hey, Mike, can you take some of these groups out for us that want to come and learn? And over five, what did I say, nine years or so, eight or nine years, I gave almost a thousand people tours of of Menominee forestry from all over the world. I have people from Brazil, from Mexico, um, people from Europe, and then people from across the United States. I think of the Pioneer Forest down in Missouri, if anyone's ever heard of that. It's another you know, 50 to 100 year uh, experiment with sustainable forest management. Um, I had their board of directors come up to Menominee. We talked about uh, Menominee forestry and similarities and differences. And I think a testament to this is if you look at satellite images of this from the 70s of Menominee, those lines are a lot starker. You see the contrast is a lot greater. And we're seeing like both to the north of the National Forest as that land grows back and matures, land in that sort of cutout of the bottom sort of part of that rectangle, that Stockbridge Muncie. Uh, reservation as they buy land back that was uh, lost during allotment, as they manage more for forests, you see that line starting to blur. My idea is that in a hundred years from now, we're going to see those lines not as stark as, as you see today, where, where there's forest and public forest in particular, uh, you're going to see that line basically dissolve as you're seeing it mm. in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and today. Huh. Uh, Mike, uh, I assume this question is about Menominee. Uh, is timber that is to be cut on indigenous lands only cut by uh, their own people or is it open to loggers outside of the tribe? So on the Menominee reservation, I'll, I'll just say every reservation is a little different. Every tribal land is a little different. The Menominee manage it really similarly to the forest service. So the Menominee foresters will go out, uh, survey an area, mark a timber sale and then open it for bids. Then they have private loggers that come and bid on it. They have special requirements, again, like the National Forest would have for logging. Uh, and they also give uh, points for loggers that have logged in the past on Menominee because they, they're certified, there are certain requirements that they have to fulfill. And they even do some trainings for their loggers. So they get more points on their bid if they've taken these trainings and if they've done successful jobs in the past. Um, so, so, Yes, there are a lot of native loggers, but there are also non-native loggers. Menominee has their own sawmill. And so the logs go to the sawmill and the loggers are basically, it's a little different than a private sale. Loggers aren't taking the logs away themselves to sell. Loggers are basically getting the logs out of the woods, bringing it to the mill for the Menominee either to mill it or they themselves then sell it to, um, sell it to another like paper mill for the pulp. Uh, interesting question, tying together two Wisconsin famous forestry people. Did uh, Aldo Leopold ever study native forest management? Did he ever write about the Menominee tribe or others? He, I don't believe he wrote about Menominee tribe. I think Aldo Leopold is a complicated figure and many people equate sort of his visions to native thought. But um, I mentioned Kyle White in the beginning, but Kyle White has a really nice essay. You could look it up around the differences between Aldo Leopold and native thought. Um, just type in Kyle White, Aldo Leopold into Google and it should come up. It, it's not behind a paywall, I think it's pretty free. Um, but no, there's other things with Aldo Leopold. I believe in, uh, that his time in the Southwest 
real and in interacting interaction with some of the native people out there um, could have influenced his thought. Um, as an aside, one of the board of directors for that pioneer forest that I mentioned is also on the Aldo Leopold Foundation board. And she's a, a, one of Leopold's biographers. She wrote Thinking Like a Mountain. Um, so there, there is connection. Oh yeah, okay. You might have to sign, like, sign your name up to get the paper off that site, but it's all free. Yeah, I didn't, I, I was able to download it a moment ago. I wanted to check in case there was a paywall or, or yeah. something, but no, it, it, that appears to be available. That's a really interesting article. I think it's good. Um, I think what, what, you know, comparing all the Leopold's values and understandings of, of ecology, wildlife, biology, land ethic, um, I think it fits in with this model. I think you can have that land ethic in the middle right, as a value. If you look at Aldo Leopold in total, think about his land ethic and how he's talking about it and using that as a way to balance the tensions. I think that fits really well with, with Leopold. Uh, I will say too, for just a little bit of clarification, as I mentioned, this was built by the college to understand the system. So it is a theoretical thing. It's a little bit heady uh, and the forests are on the ground, may or may not be thinking through all of this stuff as 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 they are cutting down, you know, doing their timber sale. However, it, um, yeah, I'll just say that. It, well, it's, it, I see another question too. Is the Menominee uh, yes. Reservation different from others in terms of land Great. ownership? And I think of Leech Lake Reservation where lots of land is privately owned by non-tribal members. Menominee is different. They were not allotted. Uh, they were terminated in the 70s, but they got a majority of their lands back in tribal uh, control. So again, that land and sovereignty piece playing into the idea of sustainability is really unique from a Menominee perspective. You know, when they didn't have control of their land, it was not seen as sustainable. That's part of the reason that that piece is put in there. Now they have control. They are more sustainable. They, they saw themselves at termination going in an unsustainable direction and really fought hard to become restored as a tribe so they could get back to that sustainability. Uh, Leech Lake is, a, is like some other uh, tribes where you have, uh, for example, forest service land, um, as well as private lands through allotment. Um, so they don't have total control over everything. But as we, as you know, from the tribal perspective, as they build stronger partnerships with the forest service, you know, I think we'll start seeing uh, more uh, management that that achieved goals that the, the band has themselves. Um, my tribe, Potawatomi, we were allotted and like we don't have that many lands. We've been buying them back like a lot of allotted tribes. So we will have more and more sovereign control over that territory um, as we move forward in the years in time. Well, Mike, thank you. It's 1258 on my clock. I think we're about at our time. I, I really want to thank you for taking the time to share this uh, with us, Mike. I'll remind viewers that we have, uh, we are recording this session and you'll find the recording on the event page on the Sustainable Forest Education website uh, within a couple of days. Uh, Caitlin just posted the link for continuing education credits for this webinar. If you're interested in getting a continuing education credit, follow that link. And I understand that when you close out of this Zoom window, that page should come up uh, directly as well. Uh, so again, uh, if you don't want CEU credits, that's just fine. But if you do, uh, make sure to complete that form. And, and on the original announcement, you could see a link to the article that I wrote about this with yeah. my College of Menominee Nation partners, and that's free to download too. Great. Yeah, it's nice when those are open access and available. So you'll find that again, I think on that same SFEC page. I know we linked it from there. So again, Mike, thank you. Thanks to all of you out there for joining us. This was really a good, uh, good way to spend an hour today uh, as the snow falls around us, at least uh, here uh, uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, take good care, everyone. Mike, thanks again. And, and I hope we'll see you all next month when we hear from DNR Forestry about uh, forest health updates uh, for the state of Minnesota. That's November 17th. Bye for now. Bye.